Chloe, can you not chew on me while I'm on the call? Maybe find anything else besides my person. Um, awesome, great. We are recording. Uh, I'll, I'll kick this out to either Kylie, Kristen, or Drew, see who wants to answer it first. Um, what running related advice or encouragement do you most often get from loved ones? Or what advice do you think you would get if you asked them? I love this question because it assumes that uh, our families know anything about X. Actually, Kylie's dad is like a total marathon boss. Um, I come from a family of like more like bird watching gardening types. So yeah, I would, I'm excited to hear how you guys answer this. Yeah, so real quick, this question kind of was interesting to me because I'm more like Zoe less like Kylie in that my family thinks I'm absolutely like batshit crazy because they don't get running at all. Like it is, it is like, there's something wrong with me mentally and that causes me to cause myself like physical pain. Um, and so it's just interesting to s even think that some people have advice or encouragement that comes from you know, their families, the people that love them the most. Um, with me uh, and my, my family always, I guess, uh, questioning my running, like, why would you sign up for a race that long? Uh, why would you, uh, like, do this to yourself? Like, don't you think you're overdoing it? Like, you look thin. Like, are you okay? Like, do you need to tell us something? Um, in my mind, those are all really, like, awesome things for them to ask me. One, because it means they love me. But two, it means, man, I'm on the right track. Like, if they think that I'm doing something wrong, or if they think that I'm doing something that appears to be masochistic in a way, it means that my training's going well. It means I'm signing up for the right races. Um, it's just definitely kind of a, a different way of looking at it. So um, I'm, I'm super, super curious to hear more from Kylie or, or more even from anyone else in the, in the group or whatever that, that has like family members, like a dad or a mom or brothers or sisters that are like, oh my gosh, like you are awesome. Like, this is awesome. Like, how can we support you? Like, that's just totally foreign to me. <laughs> I'm on the same page, Drew. I think every time I've been home to South Dakota, I'm the only person that still runs in town. So a lot, and like, I grew up in a really small town. So a lot of friends, that still live there will be like, oh, Kristen, I, yeah, like Kristen's in town. I saw someone running, you know, cause like no one does it. Um, then as far as my family goes, it, it was a struggle for a long time when I'd come back for Christmas in college or something, I'd still need to be training and want to go outside and run. And it was kind of a point of contention for a while. Cause my family was like, we never get to see you. And the first thing you do when you get home is leave to run. Like, what's the deal? Um, and then there's always been always comments about weight and, you know, how much I eat, what I eat. I have celiac disease, so I always have to, like, be careful about that. Um, so it's been, in a lot of ways, it's it's been kind of frustrating for me to be the black sheep of the family and, you know, do these things that I love that um, bring me joy. But I will say that um, it has been, I have three, I've, two nephews and one niece. My nephews, nephews are nine and three and my niece just turned five. Um, so it's been so much fun showing them just how amazing running can be. And now anytime I go visit, you know, the conversation isn't, why are you already leaving? It's like, Kristen, can we run with you? And so my parents live in the country, so we'll run to the stop sign and back. It's like half mile and we just have the most fun time. And it's cool to introduce the kids to something active um, and to like be the person they look up to in certain ways. Um, there's, I run one road half marathon every year and it's in their hometown. Um, so they make signs the night before, they come out to all of the, all of the, not I guess aid stations and like along the route and they cheer and they get excited. Um, so that's, that's definitely one thing that has helped me. And I, I sort of take that as like, you know, Kristen, we understand you're not just going to quit running. Like you love it. And it's cool now that um, even though I don't get a ton of encouragement from family, um, it's so worth it to see these little, these little loves of my life, just like enjoying running and the, the idea of it so much. 
something that you guys might try if you find yourselves in a similar scenario to, um, I, I mean, really all of us, Kristen and I aren't the only ones and, and Zoe aren't the only ones that kind of have family that's like, what the hell is going on? They don't know how to support us. And so to, to get that support and encouragement that you think you would like, uh, sometimes we have to explain to our families like, hey, like I'm going out to do this 50K and it would be really cool if I could just see you at mile 20 or mile 29 or 30 or whatever um, and, and explain to them like how they can encourage you and how they can uh, help you along the way because they want to. They love you. They just don't know how to how to encourage you properly. Right. I think um, something I think of is like inviting my parents out to come watch me try to race Leadville, which was such an incredible experience. Cause like, even though they're not super into the world of ultra running, my family is incredibly supportive. Uh, every Sunday, my dad writes me an email uh, that says, I'm proud of you, take care of yourself. And I think that that is ultimately the advice uh, that he would give is like, you know, always make sure that your health, uh, both mental and physical are at the forefront of your mind when training and uh, that he's proud of me. Um, and I think like inviting your parents out to come or, you know, any family member, like it can be a partner, sibling, like whatever it is, having like inviting them to not just like watch, but to actively participate shows that you trust them and that you like allowing them to be a part of your journey in a really active role. I think is such an incredible way to bring people along and to involve them. Oh, wow. Bowie has a full on pint glass. Not very chewable. Um, like, that, allowing them to, like really participate and like that's how my parents now my parents are like obsessed with Drew they love Drew like they love Kristen that's how they met TJ and I think it was just like the best way to just be like here is like the most direct um pathway into like what I'm passionate about and like where a large part of my heart and identity are like come get involved like I love you guys I love the sport and the more we can like interconnect these things in a way that feels good for you um, I feel like that's really, really valuable time for us. And like, I know it was kind of challenging for my parents to see me DNF in a way that was like, you know, didn't, I didn't look so hot. And I know that was like kind of tough on them, but um, I think it was also like a really amazing moment of growth for our relationship because we all were able to trust each other more. And like, man, there's nothing better than after a really tough night getting to like have breakfast with your, with your family and just know everything's gonna be okay. Yeah, I love that. I think one thing that I've learned is that like in the explaining process or like why I do what I do and why I love what I love, I'm seeing in the comments that, you know, there are quite a few athletes who experience this as well. And what I learned the hard way is, I guess it wasn't even the hard way. It was like the most endearing moment of my life. Um, so I was in college at in Eugene, Oregon, and there was one internship that I was applying for. And in order to get the internship, they also had to interview your parents, which was super weird um, to me. I don't know if that's normal. I still don't know if that's normal. Um, but uh, one thing that the guy who interviewed my dad called me immediately. He's like, Kristen, I gotta, I gotta tell you, you know, what your dad said, you might want a pen and like paper to write this down. And I did. And I keep it with me all the time. It's framed on my dresser. But he said, um, if it seems hard, she makes it look easy. If it seems impossible, she makes it look fun. And it was just like the most, because my dad's like as Midwest as they come, you know, he's like very meat and potatoes guy, keeps everything close to his chest. So to have that and to know that like, whether I'm running across the Grand Canyon and back or doing a 50 mile in Moab or whatever it is, like he might not say a lot about it, but he's psyched, you know? And I think that just kind of having that in the back of my mind gets me through a lot of those hard moments in those bigger races. Yeah, I love that. Um, this next question uh, I think is an excellent one for Kylie from an athlete. Should I wake up an hour earlier and prep for the run, eat, drink, digest, or is it better to sleep for an extra hour and roll out of bed and run? I usually do the latter, but I'm feeling like I should be eating something before some of these harder runs. Um, hi guys. <laughs> I should I didn't, I didn't comment on the last question. Oh yeah. But um. 
Your dad's a total I, I figured you badass. guys like covered everything mostly. I mean, I grew up in a family that uh, my dad ran, my mom didn't run. And so there was, I would say there was a lot of tension there in regards to like not understanding. So just explaining to, to the family members, I liked that explanation, Zoe. Um, I thought that was really good. Um, but now I'm in a relationship where the other person runs more than me. So, um, so, um, anyways, in regards to, um, the question that you just asked, um, so I think sleep is very important. Let me not, I I don't want to downplay sleep because, um, it does help with recovery. And, and I, when I'm working with athletes, I'm always like, yeah, like, do you have a sleep schedule? That's really important. So I think one thing would be looking at your sleep pattern and are you prioritizing sleep? So I think that's important to kind of point out like, yes, sleep's important. So you should have some kind of schedule for that. And if you're sleeping right up until the run, then maybe you're not getting enough sleep. So consideration of that first. And then um, in regards to eating and digesting beforehand, um, I do think that especially for female athletes, um, there has been some indication that running fasted can increase risk of stress, stress fractures. Um, so trying to potentially get something in before you go run, uh, could be beneficial, um, depending on the run. I really say like really making an effort to eat something, um, on the higher intensity days, long run days. If anyone does doubles in this group, Um, you should be doing something beforehand then as well. Um, and when I say long run days, I guess I should specify anything over an hour, um, which might not be considered long to some of you guys, but anything over an hour, you should be trying to get something in now, what that something is, it doesn't necessarily have to be like an extensive meal. Um, but it, I typically recommend like like two to 300 calories beforehand, um, mostly carbohydrate. Um, if you have trouble digesting things, you can do more simple carb, like more blended up, um, like pop a spring energy, like speed nut or something, you know, do something like that beforehand, um, or applesauce or like something, a granola bar, um, something easy that you might not have to like worry about too much. Um, the exception to that, I would say is long run days. Um, I would say you need to be more, more at either the three to 500 calorie mark. Um, if your runs between 90 minutes and two hours, if it's over two hours, I say, uh, you need to be doing five to 700 calories. Um, so if you're not doing that, then I do think that that's something that I always say long run days should be like your big training days for nutrition and train like, and training. Um, so, so trying to do all the things on that long run day interrun fueling. So practicing all of those things that you might end up, um, you know, race day would be really important. Um, so in that case, you would want to eat three, one to three hours beforehand for, you know, three to 500 calories or five to 700. Um, that might look different for everyone. Um, normally I'm saying mostly carbs again, and a little bit of, a little bit of protein. Um, so my standard is like two waffles with, uh, peanut butter or maple syrup and a uh, banana. Um, so trying to figure out what works best for you, but just, I wouldn't recommend like a full, you know, bacon and egg scramble with, um, with Dinner like one scramble. little piece of toast or something, but, <laughs> but yeah, just, uh, just working around, playing around with that. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of fully answers the question, um, in regards to like, yes, if you're, I do think especially workout days and long run days need to be prioritized to getting in fueling beforehand. Yeah. I also, I I think that's a, I totally, obviously totally agree with you as the expert on this topic. Um, and you know, in terms of sleep, go to bed earlier, like sleeping is like studying. And if you're trying to cram, you've already made a mistake, uh, get out in front of that. And I know it's sometimes hard to get to bed, but like, you know, essentially like think about when you need to run and then like backtrack from there and figure out when you need to get your nutrition in from there, how much sleep you're going to need to get and set. I'm a huge proponent of the bedtime alarm. It works even better than the wake up alarm, in my opinion. And 
again, for female athletes, it's so, so critical that you're not doing runs fasted. And I know like initially for some people, it may be a struggle to get sufficient food in. Um, but it is just absolutely part of training, like before, during, and after the running, if you're not eating enough, um, you're, you're undercutting your own training. So just always keep that at the front of mind. I love this next question. <clears throat> How do you pee if there aren't bushes or trees around, nor strategically placed rocks? This one is for the ladies. I love this question because I have zero shame. And my answer is, I mean, like, if depending on the pair of shorts, sometimes I'll sweep the shorts to the side and just squat off the trail. Um, but I mean, I don't know, like. Just go for do? it. <laughs> go for it. Yeah. Honestly, like, I think especially like in races, like the most recent race that I did was Black Canyon 60K. There were so many girls who just like, you know, I saw so many booties because people yeah. were going to the bathroom that often and nobody cares. Um, I think, you know, if you're, if you're peeing on the side of the trail, cool, great, you know, get after it. You might want to hop behind a boulder or a tree or a shrub or something if you're going to go number two. But I, I think I think everyone understands, you know, yeah. it's like, I mean, in an ideal world, you'd look for the porta potty because of the uh, environmental impacts and potential yeah. health hazard of that secondary uh, thing. But I think, you know, in terms of like peeing, like it's, I mean, here's my thing. Like I used to be a backpacking guide and like, I was always so frustrated because I primarily led crews of men and they had literally zero shame about urinating in front of me. And I would have to spend like, it felt like an hour out of my day. Like every time I needed to pee, I'd have to walk like 10, 15 minutes away. Cause I was just like, so concerned with protecting my modesty. And so do what works for you, do what makes you feel comfortable. But, um, you know, I think we can all move towards that place where you're like, you know, don't don't make other people uncomfortable if you're with a group like definitely you know do what you got to do but don't like hurt yourself or make yourself uncomfortable just for fear of making other people uncomfortable like I'm the worst like if I'm on a plane and I'm in the middle seat I will sit there for like ages just like and that's you know I, I would like to, and I'm never that person like in the wilderness and I want to embrace that you know the world is my bathroom side of myself whenever whenever possible um but i'm yeah i'm a huge fan of like the sneaky pee right out of the shorts it takes a bit of practice and there is little room for error but um i think that that works quite well for me i know like when i've done longer backpacking trips in the past something i've liked carrying with me in the backcountry is a kula cloth which is like a reusable like little hygiene wipe thing, which is great for uh, ladies with sensitive biology out on the trail. Um, and that's, and you just like let it dry in the sun outside of your pack, uh, which is fun. Cause it's also like having a cool little pea flag on your backpack, which is like a totally normal thing. If you like, I don't, I don't like every female through hiker I know uses, uses that or like, or a bandana. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, Steven says the people judging you for going on the trail are the same ones that leave their dogs poop bags on the trail. That's totally true. Yeah. I'm just like, not going to let the patriarchy shame me into not peeing wherever I want. That's like my, that's like the feminist line I draw. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. And I think like, again, like, again, like, bear in mind since sensitive environments don't pee on like cryptobiotic soil or like i don't know super tender alpine flowers environment like that um peeing on rocks is kind of like on a rock is kind of the most ideal surface you can pee on um in terms of the environmental impact which may feel awkward but you know just don't like control the splash and uh you've got this and just like don't make it weird if you don't make it weird it won't be weird Cool. Um, next question. How far out from my A race should I start gut training and focusing on nutrition? I think this is another excellent one for Kylie. This is what I talk about every day. So I might as well. <laughs> um, into a four minute speech. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Um, I normally say when you're working on fueling plants, to try to start at least two to three months before your event. 
um, cause that gives you enough time to experiment with different products. Um, and the other thing is, is making sure that, I mean, most people here probably are going to have enough long runs to practice, but making sure you have enough like longish runs to practice these things. So if, you know, if you start your taper earlier or something like keep that in mind, that might not be a good time to just like start practicing. Um, so two to three months out is the standard. And then um, looking at trying out hydration mixes, electrolytes, um, your food that you're going to eat, like food products, and then any kind of like gels or um, food blends and, and making sure that you're paying attention to like portability. And is this really going to be something that I'm going to want to like have race day or prepare race day? Like, I don't know if I want to make like an entire batch of mashed potatoes at the race event or like have to bring it in a cooler or something. So, you know, like thinking about those things and like what's most realistic for you. Um, so, so that's kind of the advice I have. And then I, I recommend trying to practice things in like a, an organized manner. So maybe not just like getting one hydration mix and practicing it once and then the next weekend doing an, another one and then the next weekend doing another one actually doing a couple of weeks with um with maybe like a similar hydration mix a similar gel and then maybe mix up the food options or something so and then moving into all right maybe i'll mix up my gel option i figured out the hydration mix or you know just giving yourself a couple of weeks for certain products and then once you finalize the the products you're going to use you want to practice that at least i usually say four to six weeks beforehand um with the exact products and the exact patterning that you're going to try to do in your event so awesome yeah i love that and i think you know again like if you're trying if you're trying to cram in terms of practicing your nutrition plan uh that's a problem like this is something that i think you know it's hard to practice too early you know like you can start dialing that in basically as soon as you know that you're even going to be doing a race that involves a complicated fuel plan i try to practice diligent i mean i practice diligent fueling on pretty much every long run. Um, and this is, you know, this is something we've seen is like some athletes, maybe you like, especially maybe in that 12 ish mile range, who will not be as like on it with the nutrition. Cause it's like hovering maybe right around like the long run, right around that two hour mark. And like, well, I just ate breakfast. Why do I need to keep eating? And you know, any run over 90 minutes, start fueling. Um, I have my athletes shoot for 200 to 300 calories an hour with a combination of like liquid, uh, gel. What is the word that you use in, for non-sports nutrition? Like banana bread? What is the term that you like, Kylie? Oh, just food options. I, we, okay. there was this conversation about using real food versus like non-real food. And I had somebody on Instagram that was commenting that, you know, we should be using the words like food versus sports nutrition products. Okay. It's like, uh, I don't know, in regards yeah. to like, uh, like people with eating disorders yourself, and like classifying food as like being superior to sports nutrition products or something. Yeah. I mean, I, I will say that's definitely something I've seen with athletes is like a reluctance to try sports nutrition because of just like online conversations about like demonizing whole thing, you know, things, you know, like if you're not just eating dates and subsisting on sunlight, then you are a gross dumpster human. Um, and I will tell you that definitely what I aim for in terms of making a fueling plan is treating my body like a straight up furnace, <laughs> not, not dicking around with dates. That's for sure. Like I want, I want the thing that's like as closest to sugar, like squirrel sugar as possible and no shame around it, but like do what works for you. But like, don't cancel out whole food groups pretty much ever. Cause that could be, you know, you're just, you could be denying your body something that it could be performing really well on. Sorry if it's like crazy loud, Bowie is unsorting our recycling and there's just nothing I can do about it. <laughs> TJ is gonna come home and the house is just gonna be like gone. All chewed, the whole thing. Um, <laughs> puppies, man. They're so great. 
I can chime in on that question um, that we just got about the injury and biking. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I, I would recommend uh, um, practicing with different fueling options on the bike. But the only thing that I'll say is typically on the bike, you can handle more nutrition. So maybe things that you (laughs) wouldn't be able to like digest as much on a, on a run in regards to um, the jostling and stuff. I just tend to work with more athletes that have issues on the run than, than on a bike. Um, so just keeping that in mind, but it, it's worth, it's definitely worthwhile to like get your hydration mix dialed in and, um, try to maybe work with some gel options and work through those things. Um, and then maybe experiment more with the food options as you get running more. So, um, oh, food options for long trail runs for people with sensitive stomachs, um, I would say boiled potatoes with salt, or as I was saying, mashed potatoes with broth is one where people um, like put it in a little reusable flask. Um, Pierogies is another one that I have gotten recently. A couple of people use pierogies as as ultra athletes. Um, And they're easy to like heat up in in the microwave or the oven and and just take them out with you if you want. Um, And then, I would say dates are a big one for people. I personally don't use those big bars and cookies and um, like breads, those sorts of things are easy to take out. And especially for if anyone like skis doing, doing the breads and the like little mini muffins and stuff is a good option that doesn't freeze. So, um, so those are some of the, I would say more, more popular ones. And then Um, in regards, like a lot of people like, like the spring energy and mirror energy, um, food blend things. So, cause they have like nut butter ones and, um, they can be a little bit more like satisfying or satiating. I'm a huge fan of Smucker's Uncrustables and Oreos. Oh yeah. The Uncrustables are huge. Like I have tons of triathletes that use those as well. Cause they don't, they <laughs> oddly enough, don't fall apart like your regular uh, PB&J that you might make at home, so. <laughs> oh yeah, Uncrustables are vegan, which is awesome. I um, cannot wait for the Uncrustables to come out with a gluten-free option. <laughs> oh, how do they, I feel like they have to, one, I mean, this is like random bit of trivia. Uh, Smuckers actually like brought essentially a Supreme Court case because they were trying to patent in making the Uncrustable. They tried to patent the concept of creating a PB and J where you put peanut butter on both sides as a way of keeping the jelly in the center and keeping it from like seeping into the bread. Um, and it was ruled that you can't legally patent like a method of PB and J making, which I think is great. And I love that they try. Ooh, Oreo Pop Tarts. They do have a Nutella version of the Uncrustables, and those are not vegan. But like, you know, I'm kind of like my philosophy is more of like risk mitigation, harm minimization, rather than ever striving for perfection or purity. And like, I ate Nutella for breakfast this morning. So sue me, I'm going to have the best run of my life later. I was actually thinking like, man, I wish that like, I feel like Nutella is just at that outer edge of what my body could reasonably metabolize during a race. Cause it is basically just, uh, there's a, a not minimal amount of fat in that. It's maybe a better recovery tool than a performance tool. There was a company in Boulder that used to make performance frosting that I was a huge fan. They made vegan performance frosting. Um, and they that don't- That was um, Rad before Rad. It was oh, it's Kelly. the same person? Yeah, it was the same person. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, I like, that was my favorite when I lived in Boulder was the performance frosting. I would like, so they sold it in jars and I would like melt it in the jar and then I would put it in a Ziploc bag, freeze it. Then I would take it on runs and just like squirt it out the end of the Ziploc bag. I'm pretty sure that's what Claire Gallagher used as fuel for her Leadville 100. She was like spooning out frosting throughout the race. Yep. 
hey, it, secrets of endurance secrets of the pros. Just like do what works for you, try stuff. Nothing is off limits. If it works for you, it is good. You know, let's not like label things like this is sports food, this is not sports food, this is real food, this is not real food because like screw it goldfish are awesome oreos are awesome uncrustables are amazing you know awesome um great next question i think this one is great for all the coaches i've been feeling really tired lately what should i be focusing on when it comes to recovery to help bring my energy levels back up is fatigue indicative of something else going on um Drew, do you want to maybe answer that one first so we can kind of go around the horn? Because I feel like this one is rich for interpretation. Yeah, so I, I like this. Um, it, it seems like it could be like a pretty like broadly interpreted question because we're talking about, I guess, recovery and I mean, all kinds of things, but um, for for me as it pertains to like energy levels and recovering and all that kind of stuff um i found that i mean i don't want to keep harping on diet nutrition and all that kind of stuff um because i know that we could literally cover diet nutrition tips for literally like like a year and not touch the tip of the iceberg but uh, for me personally a lot of that um has to do with what i put in my body um, I've recently switched to plant-based diet, um, and I've found that that's given me all the energy in the world. It's been uh, great for uh, recovery, being able to push my body further, faster than I've ever done before. Um, and again, I know I say it every week, but I'm an aging athlete at this point. I'm 35 years old. I am not as uh, young and lively as I used to be. Um, and so I've had to try to find ways to get that energy back, to get that that feeling back my lost that love and feeling right um and so uh food and hydration has been um paramount for for me uh kind of getting all that that figured out i'm gonna go ahead and chime in and say yes to all of that i agree i'm 33 and i'm kind of like on that cusp of being like well i'm not as fast as i used to be like what should i be doing how can i how can I fuel myself to one, continue to be psyched on running, but two, to not feel so tired all the time. Um, and I, at the beginning of COVID, I switched to a plant-based diet as well. And so working with Kylie, it's been, you know, snack alarm, snack alarm, snack alarms. Like I have to continue to fuel myself throughout the day. Cause a lot of times I can't, um, get up and just like go in the morning. Like a lot of athletes do. I'm, I'm typically like a mid afternoon to evening runner. Um, and so that's, that's some like fueling throughout the day is really important for me to, to one recover well, but also to like feel energized enough to get in a solid run. Kylie, any nutrition tips um, that we haven't I, covered and that fit into a reasonable amount of time? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, if you are having energy issues, I mean, it, it can be quite complicated. So we did talk about sleep earlier. And I think that that is something you need to consider. Stress is something you need to also consider. What are your stress levels? Um, looking at hydration, hydration's huge. Uh, if you're dehydrated, it can affect your energy and performance. Um, so looking at that and do you have a regular um, hydration uh strategy set up for, for yourself throughout the day a lot of athletes don't um so and a good easy starting place is to take your meals pair uh pair hydration with meals and snacks so um, psychology wise we know that if we pair activities together we're more likely to do them um so it, it pairing a glass of water or a lacroix or something with your meals and snacks can be a good way to get up the hydration um, and then in regards to the like actual micronutrient or macronutrient intake, um, really making sure that you're not skipping meals, um, which was kind of emphasized a little bit by Kristen with the snack alarms, <laughs> the meals and snacks. Um, and then looking at, um, make sure you're not doing like too low in carbohydrate, um, protein's another one that can cause uh, issues if you 
Do you have a relative protein deficiency? Um, and then micronutrient wise, it would be a good idea sometimes for people, especially if you've been low energy for a while to consider getting a little bit of blood work done, um, looking at your B12 um, and um, ferritin levels specifically. Um, so that can be a good way to just get a gauge on, on where you're at for that. Um, and yeah, I know it's on, we emphasize it a lot, but just like eating enough and, and having an idea of like, what are my needs? If I am running this much, um, mileage, like what do I know what my needs are? Or am I just assuming that, oh, I only need like 1500 calories a day, which is probably not enough. So making sure that you have that awareness of, um, of what your actual needs are. Um, so I think that was a good, maybe summary. Yeah, I, you know, agree with and echo everything everyone else has said. I think, you know, I like to start with asking questions rather than making assumptions about why things like are feeling how they're feeling. Um, and so starting with like, okay, noticing that there's fatigue and instead of being judgmental, being curious about it and trying to find if there could be an underlying cause um, rather than just assuming like, oh, I'm tired, I must be weak or, oh, I'm tired, I must be out of shape or, oh, I'm tired. That's just like how life is and how all humans feel because, in order for training to be productive, you should be feeling good. Um, and if there, if you aren't feeling good, then we need to take steps to address that because we do not want to ever use fatigue as a proxy for productive training because um, scientifically speaking, it just isn't. Like yes, during intense training, there will be moments of fatigue, but sustained fatigue is not a sign of adaptation. In fact, it's a sign that you are most likely not adapting. Um, and so trying to just ask questions like, is there potentially like a short term stressor that we can alleviate or at least like counterbalance? Like, let's say you have a big presentation or project at work. Well, you know, as your coach, I can't do anything about what's going on at work, but I can absolutely lower the um, acute stress in training. So what I might do is adjust your training so that you aren't doing intensity and maybe drop the volume a little bit. So instead of doing like a big Wednesday workout, we'll do, you know, 40 to 60 minutes it's easy, you know, like maybe even without a watch, just to make sure that you're keeping things really purely easy. I know for a lot of people when they're feeling stressed, there will be an inclination to like, ah, oh, get it, like white knuckle, get the run done. Um, if you're feeling truly stressed, truly fatigued, don't push a run, um, err on the side of caution. Like, yes, life will make you tired. Life will make you a little bit stressed. So like there is a balance. And if you are, if you have consistent underlying stress, consistent underlying fatigue, um, that is something we need to address um, outside of training. And there might be some life factors that we can work on rearranging um, because at a certain point, if you're, if there's like, you know, stress is a pie. And if like the life stress side of the pie is squeezing out training entirely, then we need to take concrete steps to be able to open things up a little bit. Um, you know, that could just be asking for help at work, asking for help at home, learning to advocate for yourself in ways or saying no to things. And these are things that um, I would recommend working on with a non Zoe professional in this realm, because my experience, knowledge and ability, uh, ability to change things like on the ground in your life is limited, but basically try to open up the uh, training section of that pie. Um, and then just making sure that you are keeping things super, super easy. If there's not a concrete life stress, maybe examine like how has your sleep been? How has your nutrition been? If those things haven't been great, then start to address those things in a real and concrete way. Don't just like say, oh, I'm tired that sucks. Be like, I'm tired. So I am going to go to bed earlier tonight. Or I noticed I was under fueled. I am going to take intentional steps to rectify that because without taking those intentional steps, the task of noticing things is, you know, kind of rendered moot. Um, so start to recognize what the underlying cause of that feeling of fatigue might be, and then look to fix that. If there is, if you don't immediately, like if there isn't a specific thing you can point to work-life stress, um, maybe being underfueled, maybe being a little bit underslept, if there's not a specific thing you can point to and you feel fatigued for three days consecutively, that is the point at which I ask my athletes to take three days off and go see a medical professional. Cause that's the point at which like, if we can't immediately point to something, um, then there is 
you know, there, we just need, we need, I'm not saying it's like a, you know, may, it may be nothing, but it may be something. And we're not going to train through what could be an underlying medical issue that can't just be addressed through time off through training. Um, and again, like if you're feeling stressed and fatigued for multiple, multiple days in a row, really the best solution is just to back off entirely and wait for your things to kind of reach homeostasis again, because pushing through fatigue has never once made anyone feel less fatigued and kind of the rule that we, and I know we've talked about this a lot, but if you're having a day where it was like kind of a long day at work and you're on the fence about the run, give it the 15 minute rule, right? Like if you go out for 15 minutes and you start like things start to click and you feel better after running for 15 minutes, awesome continue and do the run. If you don't feel better and you're like, this is just going to be a slog. That's going to make me feel more fatigued. Maybe I won't even have a good run tomorrow. Like I'm just digging myself deeper in a hole. That's a great time to shut off the watch, um, walk home and focus on fueling and sleep rather than feeling guilty about having a less than perfect run. This is something that absolutely every single elite athlete and coach has done. It is totally normal and absolutely not worth beating yourself up over because being mean to yourself and looking down to yourself has never once made you like, never, ha never has it turned around that situation. So again, approach this kind of thing with curiosity rather than expectations of what kind of athlete you should be and what that should feel like on a day-to-day -day basis. Cause there's always going to be just crappy outlier days. And the best thing you can do is just work through them and then try to troubleshoot, um, in a non-judgmental way. Um, keeping in mind that mental and physical health are always the most important things, um, in terms of training. Yeah. That's kind of my, my answer is like, just make sure you're not trying to force through runs when you're feeling super fatigued. Cause that's not productive for training. Like even for ultra running, like I've had a lot of athletes be like, I felt like total crap today, but I ran super hard anyway, because 100s. And I'm like, that's not, let's not do that. I want to reemphasize too, what you said, Zoe, that's so important is that people do find that balance. If you are stressed and because you're stressed, you talk to your coach and tell them like, listen, I've got a lot going on in life right now. Is it all right if I take a day off? Of course, like we're going to work with you, obviously. But if you are stressed and every time you're stressed, you don't run, let me tell you, you might not be running very much moving forward. And so trying to find that balance is just, is very, very important and communicating your stressors uh, with your coach so that we can kind of understand um, your, your program moving forward is, is vital. Yeah. And this is like, I mean, you know, and being able to try to advocate for yourself, understanding I come from a place of privilege and I'm afforded because of my job, some amount of flexibility, I block out on my calendar, the time of day that I typically like to run so that people will not reach out to me. They will not try to schedule meetings with me. They know that I have an obligation that's important to me. And that time is really special for me. Um, so try to find whatever way you can to um, mitigate that. Like, you know, I coach doctors, nurses, flight attendants, detectives, like I know that, you know, you can't just block out your flight attendant calendar and say, I won't be on a plane at noon any day. Like I understand that the lived reality of other people's lives is different, but see what you can do. Try to find a solution that does work for your own life to help consistency, um, you know, to help prioritize consistency in your life, because it's not just going to happen. Um, and there's going to have to be some amount of balance finding, and you're in the driver's seat for that process. Like I would like, I would love to be able to email all my athletes bosses and be like, you know, uh, this girl is a total boss in life and training. You need to give her lunch off every day. I'm talking two hours. That way she gets her run in and then gets to spend at least an hour eating. Um, that would be like my ideal world. I know that's not how things actually work, but if you struggle with advocating for yourself, imagine how Zoe would advocate for you. And then just send that email in all caps with abundant unicorn emojis and see how far that gets you. Awesome. Well, last question, one that we've uh, worked through before. Um, what is a running related question that you are actively exploring? Um, I'll jump in only because I know that last time we kind of touched on this question. Um, I think that I spouted out about 50 words in five seconds and it didn't really come across very clear. And so um, as a runner and a coach, I feel like I've always tried, I guess, different strategies and methods of training and tried to 
I guess, use them on myself before I just have some person um, be like, hey, like you should do this. And I have no clue what happens because I've never done it myself. Um, and so with me personally, I used to be a really high mileage runner running um, like 100 mile weeks was normal. Like that's like average, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. But if I wasn't running 100 miles a week, it meant that I could be doing better, I guess. And so um, as I'm getting older, my body can't handle that anymore. And so I've tried uh, reducing volume and increasing pace slightly, kind of like that, that saying quality over quantity. Um, and, and that's really, really worked out for me lately. Um, and, and I don't know, just something that I'm, I'm exploring still, because again, uh, running doesn't get easier as you get older, it turns out. Um, Part of that is also like the mental side of running, where if I can uh, get a certain pace uh, mentally, like comfortable, like like for me, I used to run my hundred mile weeks at like seven minute pace, and that was normal. But what if I reduced mileage, ran everything at like six minute pace, and if can I get six minute pace to feel comfortable and normal? And if so, what does that mean for racing? Does my race pace decrease? Does my uh, uh, recovery decrease or increase? Like, what does that look like? And so that's been a big one. I'm, I'm again, still actively exploring. And as soon as I figure it out, I will let everybody know. <laughs> Kristen or Kylie? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I agree with everything that Drew says all the time, 100%. Um, I think I will note that that is a, in terms of like, that's a very marathon training specific thing. And if you are trying to do all of your training miles at six minute pace, and then trying to rock a 50 miler, you are going to be in a world of uh, positive split pain. <laughs> yes. Agreed with that as well. Um, I think, I don't know. I've been running competitively since I was 12. So a lot of times I'll go through these like ebbs and flows of figuring out what my why is. Um, and there are definitely moments where I question everything that I'm doing and what it means. Um, but the funk never, it never lasts for too long. I mean, sometimes it takes a while for me to get psyched on running again, but typically when this happens, I like to take a step back and start getting into like, you know, Zwift or yoga or join a softball league or something that keeps me active. That makes running fun for me. Um, cause I don't. I think that one of the worst things is, you know, when you experience your perception of running as a chore and not something you get to do, it becomes something you have to do. Um, and I've, I mean, I've been running for 20, I, math is hard, but like 20 plus years at this point competitively. And it's like, you, like, I'm not, I'm not going to sugarcoat it and say that it's, you know, I'm hundred percent psyched on it all the time. It's amazing because sometimes it sucks. And sometimes, you know, there are um, deficiencies that I've experienced with iron or vitamin D or, you know, low ferritin levels where it just, it makes it hard. So you, I'm constantly asking myself, like, why am I doing this? What's the point of this? And finding those answers is really rewarding and valuable because if I've been doing something for 20 years, I mean, obviously there's a reason why. So it's, it's kind of cool to have watched and um, just understood that like the why will change. Um, but it's always, there's always a reason to like get out the door and run, you know, it's always fun for me, so. Kylie? I can go. <laughs> um, I would say that mine is um, I was working through the injury thing, but I'm finally running consistently again. So that's good. Um, and mine is going to be embracing my weak areas of, um, of running in regards to hill, like hill workouts. Um, so hills have never really been like my strength. And so um, recently I had like a uh, five by three minute hills, four by one minute hills on top of that. And that's like a huge workout for me. And, and, um, you can either look at that as like, oh man, this sucks. Like I, I don't want to do this like hill workout. Cause I feel like I'm bad at them. Or you can look at it as, okay, I'm going to do this and give it up my all. And then, um, try to try to improve upon my weaknesses. So that's something that 
I'm working on right now. I love that answer. And I feel like it points to um, something that I see as a coach a lot is you'll have an athlete come in and they'll have like what they think they're really good at. And that'll be the thing. That'll be the muscle that they want to flex in training, right? Like you'll have someone that comes from a track background and they ran cross country and they're transitioning to trail and they just want to get fast, fast, fast and not, um, you know, try higher volume or push endurance or work on hill climbing ability. They want to just train the strength. On the other side, you'll have a lot of people come in. They're like, nope, I'm a 100 mile runner. All I want to do is get better at grinding. Um, I'm not concerned about speed at all. I'm very happy where I am and I am not going to push my comfort zone at all. Um, and I would say that the athlete that I think is most likely to thrive over time is the athlete that has an awareness of what their strengths and weaknesses is, are. Um, and pay attention to their strengths and nurture their strengths and own their strengths, but really embrace their weaknesses as well and try to train those and don't shy away from diving into workouts with a lot of vulnerability that flex the muscle that maybe they're a little bit less comfortable flexing. Because if all you ever do is train your strengths, then like, you're just, you're going to be leaving so much potential on the table um, and really um, getting excited about having the opportunity to work on and drill those maybe those skill sets or abilities that are less comfortable and maybe feel less natural to you. Um, that's the athlete that's going to really, really kick butt for, for a long time. And is going to be able to grow uh, the most, not just physically, but also I think in terms of their mental endurance and resilience as well. Um, yeah, I guess I don't know what question I'm actively exploring. I'm um, really trying to use running um, always as a platform to like build broad coalitions of uh, a diverse range of people um, on issues I really care about. I'm working on, uh, I work on the National Advisory Committee for Runners for, I'm now the chairperson, which is exciting, uh, for Runners for Public Lands. I'm working with Ultra Sign Up. Uh, this is fun, exclusive information. We're working on launching an initiative to include carbon offsets with every um, race sign up starting Earth Day. Um, and I think that that's going to be a really amazing way to involve and incorporate more people um, and engage them on climate in a way that's like a little more approachable than, you know, telling them that they need to like go pick it or, or not race or something. I think being able to give uh, people a way to participate in climate solutions that fits into the context of their lived experiences, how to make that um, accessible. And I feel like that's where running comes in for me is it's just a thing that I have in common with a lot of people. And so how do I use that to um, advance climate goals? And how do I use that as a conversation starter with people that I wouldn't normally be in conversation with? And how do I use that as a way of getting out of my echo chamber and um, involving people in climate solutions? So yeah, get excited to offset some carbon. Um, Awesome. Well, this was so great, you guys. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. So great to see um, your faces, your pets' faces, hear what weird sounds they're making in the background. Um, shout out to Lotsi, you the loudest for sure. <laughs> um, actually, Bo is pretty dang loud today. She's holding her own. She, uh, it actually, maybe 20 minutes ago, she managed to open two doors, go into the bathroom, grab the plunger, and break it in half. So that's going to be fun to clean uh, plunger shards out of the couch before TJ gets home. So can't wait for that. Um, it's a good start to the Friday. I hope everyone has an amazing day. It makes me so happy to see everyone's faces. All right. Bye. Thank you, Zoe. Bye. <laughs>